it's an honor for me to participate in this session and I thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to tell you a little bit about our work on the use of two-photon microscopy to assess metabolic function using endogenous contrast. Okay. Cellular metabolism refers to a set of pathways and processes that the cell has developed to produce energy and to synthesize important components for its function. So as you may imagine, whenever a disease develop, including, develops, including diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular uh, disease, neurodegenerative uh, diseases, and, and cancer, they're typically associated with a significant um, metabolic dysfunction. And while we understand quite a bit uh, about metabolic pathways, uh, we still have a lot of uh, way to go, especially in terms of understanding dynamic changes in metabolism and heterogeneity. Mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell. Uh, that's where most of our energy is produced, and these are uh, unique um, structures that uh, continuously fuse and fission throughout the life cycle of a cell to um, ensure that energy is produced and delivered in a highly efficient manner. Um, making connections between mitochondrial uh, morphology and mitochondrial function is something that we're just starting to do, and I think that's an area where some of the optical tools we're developing actually can make um, an important impact. So we have uh, a wide range of tools to assess cellular metabolism. Um, PET and fMRI are mainstays uh, of uh, the clinic to assess brain function and detect uh, tumors based on metabolic uh, changes and or uh, differences. In the lab, we use techniques such as carbon labeling and mass spec and uh, a whole range of other biochemical assays to um, assess metabolism and those fuel this uh, recent explosion in metabolomics and to uh, look at mitochondrial morphology and function. There's great interest in developing uh, probes to assess uh, mitochondrial function and morphology, ideally in live cells. Uh, each of these tools has its advantages, but also certain uh, limitations. Uh, one particular challenge is that metabolism is highly dynamic. And uh, metabolic, maybe, ah, maybe, metabolic changes, there we go, okay, they're highly dynamic. And uh, these changes can occur in the order of seconds and minutes, or they can occur over a period of days, weeks, months, and years. So destructive techniques such as mass spec, carbon um, labeling, are not really well suited to characterize this type of, of um, dynamic change. As we've already heard, metabolic changes are also highly heterogeneous. And uh, we're starting to understand this heterogeneity more and more. And um, we're interested uh, in actually um, understanding its meaning and its impact, uh, for example, in our inability to treat diseases such as um, cancer. So if um, metabolism is um, dynamic and heterogeneous, uh, and the tools that we have are not um, sufficient to characterize that, then what are the pretty images that I've been showing you that um, indicate um, these characteristics? Um, nature has given us uh, a gift uh, of uh, two uh, fluorophores, NADH and FAD, that naturally fluoresce. NADH and FAD are present in all cells, um, and they naturally absorb light, and they emit light and characteristic uh, wavelength. We want to do metabolic imaging in a three-dimensional tissue, so we're going to exploit the two-photon uh, characteristics uh, so that we can image deep and with high resolution and two photon excitation and emission characteristics of NADH and FAD uh, have been uh, well established. Uh, we also know quite a bit about the fluorescence lifetime properties of these chromophores. So we know, for example, that NADH uh, that is free in the cytosol has a much lower uh, lifetime than NADH that's bound and is typically found in uh, mitochondria. The fluorescence of NADH has been known for decades, and it's actually uh, this beautiful optical signal that attracted biochemists like Britain Chance to optics uh, to perform really fundamental uh, studies in the field of biomedical um, optics. So 
why, since we know about the signals for so many years, we haven't been able to exploit them uh, and use them uh, more broadly in biochemistry for metabolic studies? The answer is, it's complicated. Uh, so uh, metabolic pathways are um, com complex, um, interconnected, and fortunately or unfortunately, NADH and FAD are involved in many of these pathways. So uh, while we have exquisite time and space uh, resolution, we do not have a specificity which many biochemists need to understand what are the mechanisms that are involved in the signals that we are um, detecting. So can we do something about that? Um, in my group, to start addressing um, this question, we have started thinking about a multi-parametric approach. We have different opti optical metabolic readouts. One of them is this optical redox ratio, which is based on the intensity of the uh, two-photon excited fluorescence of FAD and NADH. So for every NADH and FAD um, pixel that we collect, we can reconstruct this intensity ratio, and we have these redox-coded images, so every pixel and every different hue uh, represents a slightly different metabolic state in the cell and within a cell. And this is a readout that we have validated against um, mass spec with different types of cells. Another metabolic readout is the NADH bound fraction. So this is a readout that we extract from uh, fluorescence lifetime images. Uh, this is a phaser uh, display of, again, fluorescence lifetime that we acquire uh, from NADH um, images, and we do a simple analysis to basically extract the relative fraction of NADH that's found in bound form in the mitochondria, and that's another metabolic biomarker. And again, we can create this redox, no, this NADH bound fraction uh, coded uh, images uh, to uh, figure out what's going on metabolically. A third biomarker is this mitochondrial clustering or fragmentation. This is a metric we've been developing in my group for about 10 years now. Uh, we rely on the NADH two photon excited fluorescence intensity images. We do some signal processing and some uh, 2D uh, Fourier analysis, and we extract this parameter beta, uh, which is correlated to the levels of mitochondrial fragmentation. So when beta goes up, mitochondria become more fr fragmented. When beta goes down, mitochondria become more highly organized. So we can monitor all these three different parameters, for example, in 2D cultures that we expose to different metabolic perturbations, hypoxia and glucose starvation is shown here um, as an example. Uh, we can do highly dynamic measurements and we can see how each one of the parameters changes in response to that metabolic perturbation. What is interesting is that we see, for example, when we introduce um, hypoxia, uh, redox ratio goes down. Uh, when we starve uh, glucose, uh, redox ratio is starting to go up and so on and so forth. So things are changing in different ways depending on the type of metabolic perturbation uh, we introduce. We can do this um, in three-dimensional tissues, and uh, here you see, again, redox-coded um, images from uh, normal epithelial tissues compared to this uh, sort of cervical precancer uh, tissues. Again, different hues correspond to different uh, metabolic redox uh, ratios, different metabolic states. Uh, so it's clear that the normal tissues are very different from the cervical precancerous tissues, but they're also different from these tissues that are actually uh, differ by the overexpression of only one or two oncoproteins that are associated with a human papillomavirus uh, 16 expression. Uh, so um, we can see differences, we can uh, quantify them, um, again, as a function of uh, depth. Uh, this is the type of resolution that we cannot get with a PET or an fMRI uh, machine. Uh, and of course, we can uh, look at the overall metabolic uh, state of uh, the tissues and uh, characterize the differences. We can take redox images over time, in this case, for example, to characterize uh, the metabolic state of stem cells uh, exposed to adipogenic differentiation media and see how dynamically the, some of them uh, decide to become fat cells. And again, interestingly enough, um, right, uh, cells that are right next to that 
very fat cell, um, basically are not doing much. Um, these are uh, stem cells that um, are exposed to propagation media, so they're there, remaining undifferentiating, uh, but their metabolic uh, state is uh, definitely changing, and you see a beautiful heterogeneity here. We can do this in animals, so these are examples of now uh, NADH-bound fraction-coded images from uh, different types of adipose tissues of uh, mice. Uh, so we see brown, beige, and uh, white adipose tissue from mice exposed to room temperature or to uh, cold, extreme cold, for a couple of days. Uh, and we see very beautiful uh, differences uh, between the different types of adipose tissues and in response to this cold activation. And again, we can monitor the redox ratio and the lifetime at the same time. And we can use these optical biomarkers in combination to differentiate the different uh, tissue, ty tissue types and monitor um, the responses to cold, for example. We can do this in vivo uh, in humans, and this is work in collaboration with uh, Bruce Stromberg's uh, group. So uh, when we induce, for example, hypoxia um, in the arm of a human subject, I will not name names, um, we can see the NADH intensity immediately uh, going up, and then hypoxia uh, is resolved, and NADH goes down. Mitochondrial clustering that we extract from analysis of the same images goes up, but interestingly, it stays up after uh, hypoxia is resolved. So some interesting differences in the dynamics of these two optical biomarkers. We can use uh, this mitochondrial uh, clustering to assess depth-dependent uh, changes in mitochondrial organization in uh, the epithelial tissues of normal uh, human uh, patients uh, and compare them to depth-dependent organization of mitochondria from uh, basal cell carcinoma and melanotic uh, lesions. And we can identify, again, quantitative parameters that we can use to develop diagnostic algorithms to separate the disease from the healthy tissues. Uh, so I have shown you um, beautiful images, of course I'm biased, um, uh, demonstrating heterogeneity and um, time uh, dynamic uh, measurements. Uh, can uh, we get any information that's specific? And I think we're getting there. Um, so uh, we've recently completed a set of uh, studies in which we exposed different types of cells to a variety of different metabolic perturbations. So perturbing glycolysis, glutaminolysis, uncoupling, fatty acid oxidation, fatty acid synthesis. And we monitored simultaneously all these three optical biomarkers. Interestingly, what we found is when we looked at the change, the combined changes in these biomarkers and we plotted them in this three-dimensional space, each one of these metabolic perturbations occupied a unique space. Now that's, to me, really exciting and really interesting because it suggests that we can monitor optically changes in these three parameters and by figuring out in what space uh, these uh, changes occur, we can get some mechanistic insights regarding the metabolic uh, pathway that's being perturbed. So, um, there's, I can, I can end with this beautiful slide, or I can tell you um, uh, where I think I'm hoping this is going. I think there's a nice um, uh, convergence in uh, developments in lasers, probes, um, analytical uh, tools to uh, uh, extract functional information from these um, images that I think can make this functional microscopic imaging ready for uh, prime time in use for metabolic studies that we do in the lab to look at tissues in three dimension or um, animals uh, that are models of uh, disease and get fundamental information regarding dynamic metabolic behavior and understanding a little bit be uh, better the origins and the impact of that heterogeneity we can gain, uh, in this way, I think, important insights regarding uh, new uh, therapeutic, uh, new pathways that we can use as therapeutic targets to develop new drugs, use the same techniques to assess the safety um, and the efficacy of these drugs, and optimize treatment. Uh, there's already great potential shown uh, in this um, 
aspect by uh, work that Melissa Scala uh, is doing, looking at metabolic responses from uh, patient um, isolated uh, organoids uh, that she monitors metabolically to predict response in uh, human uh, patients. Uh, so uh, we're getting ready, I think, I'm hoping to use this really in the clinic, either uh, directly or through a probe, and get images, high-resolution microscopic images that provided to the clinician uh, to get not only morphological information, but also functional information. And then hopefully they can use the combination of morphology and function to make um, decisions regarding diagnosis and treatment that um, are more personalized and optimized. Thank you uh, to the students, the collaborators, and the funding sources.